All right, we're starting our study, the book of Ruth. <clears throat> I want to go always when I start a book, you know how I do that, and then I'll repeat it a little bit, and then less and less and less. But I want to say some things uh, in the nature of an introduction. I always do that, and people think, well, introduction's just downtime, and it's not downtime. Uh, you have to have some sense of, of what the book's about, where it is, that kind of thing. It helps us as we study the book. If we know those now, there's a lot of unknowns when you're talking about the book of Ruth, the book in terms of who wrote the book, it, the, the book gives no hint as to the identity of its author. You can read there's just nothing in there that indicates who wrote it. Now, there is certain rabbinic literature, which is a certain rabbinic literature known as the Babylonian Talmud, which was compiled or finalized around A.D. 500 to A.D. 550. That attributes the authorship of the book of Ruth to Samuel. But uh, there's, there are problems with that identification. And a major problem with that claim is that Samuel, he lived in the late judges period. And you'll see that there, there are a number of indications in the book that, that the book, at least in its final form, was written a significant period of time after the judges period. So if Samuel's from the Judges period and the book in its final form is written a good ways after the Judges period, Samuel couldn't be the author of it, at least in its final form. Now, you could say, well, Samuel had a hand in writing some earlier form of it that some other inspired author then took in and put in final form. But, you know, that's just speculation. And this idea, you know, the fact that it shows up in the Babylonian Talmud in A.D. 500, which could have an earlier tradition, but... We don't have anything earlier than that to tie Samuel to the book. So basically, the authorship of the book is unknown. And you say, well, that troubles me. But, you know, God certainly can inspire people, right? I mean, you don't have to know who it is to know that it's inspired. And so here it is. We don't know the author. Now, uh, the date of the book, there's also questions about, well, when's the book written? Chapter 1, verse 1, it makes clear that the author's writing about events that took place in a former time. So he, the author is looking back on an earlier time, and these events took place in a time that's identified as the days when the judges ruled. So writing now about events from a former time, that former time is the days when the judges ruled, and the period when judges ruled, that period commenced not long after Joshua's death, not long after Joshua's death, which one can reasonably estimate. I mean, there are certain assumptions made, but you can reasonably guess that Joshua died in 1366 B.C. And the period of Judges begins not long after his death. And the period of Judges, it ends with the anointing of Saul as king in 1 Samuel chapter 10, which one can estimate it took place around 1051 B.C., so roughly we're talking about a period of time of 300 years, the period of Judges, depending how long after Joshua's death you want to start the period of Judges, 315 years from Joshua's death to Saul's being anointed king. That's the period of time we're talking about, okay? Roughly 1366 to 1051. And the writer's writing looking back on that time, telling us about in those days, be writing back about former time. Now, the fact David's genealogy, <clears throat> but the fact David's genealogy is given at the end of the book, that means that it was written after David had become king. You see, it was written after David had become king, after he'd become someone whose genealogy was of special interest and significance. I mean, you don't wind up ending up with David's genealogy if nobody knows who David is. So that puts it back. David is... is installed as king around 1011 B.C., so, so it can't be written before then, uh, at least in its final form it can't be. Now, Ruth chapter 4, verse 7, it shows that the book was written so long after Boaz redeemed Elimelech's property that the, the custom for confirming that transaction had been forgotten. There was a certain way that that transaction was confirmed, and the writer has to tell people about it. So they had forgotten that. So that says, OK, well, it's, it's long enough after that. So you think that's going to take at least a few generations. So we're down at least to the time of David, if not beyond that. Now, based on their certain linguistic evidence, those who are competent to assess such things, most scholars today are convinced that the book was written 
before the Babylonian exile. Okay, before 587, 586 B.C. But the range of dates is huge. It goes from the 10th century, from the time of David, all the way down to the beginning of the 6th century B.C., just before the exile. So you have a large range where you have different people saying it was written at this time, this time, this time. So it tells us that, that, that we're not really certain about the authorship, and the date is a matter that's up in, up in the air also. What about the themes and the purpose? Now, it's very easy to read the book, of, the book of Ruth simply as an engaging story. It's a great story. You see, the Spirit of God can, can inspire in artistic fashion. So this is a, it, it, but it's, it's easy to read it simply as an engaging story that promotes these virtues of loyalty and kindness and generosity, that it promotes them by showing that God rewards that kind of behavior. But there's more to it than that. You see, as Raymond Dillard and Tremper Longman say in their book, An Introduction to the Old Testament, reading it simply that way, quote, distorts the book and misses its profound theological teaching. There is a lot more than simply a little moral tale in here that says, you see, Ruth really was a neat person and God did write by her. You see, there's more going on, and I want to try to draw some of that out uh, as we go through the book. There is a link. There is a link to David at the beginning of the book in verses 1 and, one and 2 through the identification of Elimelech as a man of Bethlehem in Judah and through the more specific identification of his family, they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. So he repeats that. He says, Elimelech's a man from Bethlehem in Judah. And then in verse 2, he says the family, they were Ephrathites in Bethlehem from Bethlehem in Judah. And this is a link to David, okay? So we know that it's being written after David has become king because his genealogy ends it. So he's already somebody prominent. And David, we know, from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 12, David is described there as a son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem of Judah. You see, so this is a link right at the very beginning. This is a link to King David. When you have this, this emphasis on Bethlehem and Judah, Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah, and there's also a link to David in the genealogy with which the book concludes. So it opens up with this tie to David, men of, Ju- men of Bethlehem and Judah, Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah, and it ends with the genealogy of David, beginning and end. So that suggests that the, that the primary, uh, the book was written primarily, this is not the only thing it does, but it was written primarily to reinforce the truth that the Davidic dynasty was instituted by God. Primarily to reinforce that truth, that David's family ruled by divine right. That's what a dynasty is. Your family rules. That God has said the rulership is with David and his family. So it looks like that the, the primary focus of the book is not simply that, well, if you show hesed, you show this kindness that you get blessed. That's something. That's true. But more is going on in the writing of this book and the the theological purpose of the book. Now, the book reinforces this idea that that the truth that David, that the Davidic dynasty was instituted by God. It reinforces that truth by implying God's providential hand in David's ancestry, paralleling the guidance that he'd given in the ancestry of the patriarchs. Okay, so you see that God is at work. This is when you see God doing this kind of thing. You can see that, well, God has instituted this. Why? Because he is shepherding the ancestry and bringing David into existence. So one of these things, one way that it does that is by showing, implying his providential hand in, in, in David's ancestry. And it also does that by highlighting that lowly Bethlehem, if you know the story, lowly Bethlehem is here. It's an oasis of honor in the dark days of Judges. I'll say a little bit about Judges and you know about the period of Judges. But Bethlehem here is really a, a place where the people are receiving of Ruth. You have Boaz, who is a, you know, a paragon of kindness and generosity. So it, it reinforces this idea that, that the Davidic dynasty is of God by doing that. And it also reinforces that the Davidic dynasty is instituted by God by answering presumed criticism of David's Moabite heritage. You can see people who are resisting the Davidic dynasty, right, by saying, listen, there's a Moabite here in his lineage and using that against the validity of David's rulership. 
And one of the things it does is, is that it shows that God instituted this dynasty by asserting the, the nobility of his Moabite great grandmother and her Jewish husband, Boaz. So I think in all these things, I think the dominant theme, what it's doing in purpose is to reinforce this truth that the Davidic uh, dynasty is instituted by God. And it does this in several ways. Now, this purpose, if that's right, if that's the right reading of the primary purpose of the book, well, then it suggests that the book was written during a time when the Davidic monarchy was being resisted. OK, why would somebody write this book? They would write a book that would counter those kinds of things if it was, you know, if you're in a time when somebody's resisting that. Well, you can see, well, when was it resisted? It was resisted during David's time. It was resisted during Solomon's time. And there are a number of scholars who, for that reason, place the date of the book during David's reign or Solomon's reign. Like Robert Hubbard in his commentary in the New International Commentary in the Old Testament, he puts it with Solomon. Okay, and that's, that's the reasoning for that. And you can see that, but Daniel Block, in his commentary in the New American Commentary series, he makes an interesting case for the book being written to silence detractors during this renaissance of the Davidic dynasty under Josiah. Okay, so you have where, where the Davidic kingdom was, again, stretching its muscles, exerting itself. So you have kind of this renaissance of the Davidic dynasty under Josiah from 640 B.C. to 609. Now, none of this can be demonstrated conclusively, but this is his idea. And I think it's, it's interesting that not only accounts, if that's correct, that it's written during the reign of Josiah, that not only accounts for the presence in the book of what, you, what is called standard biblical Hebrew and late biblical Hebrew. You have both of those in the book, so that would account for that. And I think it would better uh, account for the delay that you get suggested in Ruth 4, 7, uh, than, than if you just put it right in David and Solomon. It seems like there's a longer period of time suggested there. So you, you could go David, Solomon, Josiah during the dates. But the theme, I think, the dominant theme here is has something to do with David. Now, though, that's the primary goal, I think. The primary purpose is to reinforce this truth that the Davidic dynasty is instituted by God. In telling that story, the author develops other themes OK, develops these ancillary things. They're not in, you know, they're, they're not insignificant. But I just think the primary purpose is that. But you still have these themes that are developed in the process of 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 filling this other purpose. And one of those is that God's kindness and mercy are shown through his working in and through the everyday lives of ordinary people. To preserve Elimelech's lineage from extinction and to reverse Naomi's and to a lesser extent Ruth's dire circumstance of childless widowhood. Now, there are a couple of things here. Elimelech's line going extinct. I think a lot of Americans would say, who cares? <laughs> I just think our idea that, you know, that so what my family line dies off, that this doesn't, you know, that doesn't bother me. But this wasn't how this was perceived. You see, for his line to die is he's dying and his whole presence is dead. And so it's quite a thing for him, to, for his lineage to be spared from extinction. So you have here that, that, that God is rewarding something. God is showing his kindness and mercy in doing that and reversing Naomi, her circumstance of childless widowhood. I'll say a little bit more about that when we get to the text. But that was a really tough situation to be in. To be a childless widow in the ancient world was a really, really difficult spot to be in. So I think you see this being developed. You see, Elimelech's lineage is continued. Naomi's childless widowhood is reversed. Her emptiness is reversed, even exalting them within Israel by bringing through them the great King David. Now, that's quite an honor. And you're going to see this reversal that happens in Naomi's life. Where she is in a horrible situation and what winds up coming out of it, she is exalted within Israel because she is in the line of David's king, the great King David. OK, she she becomes that part of that. And of course, King David, one, uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, one who's far greater. That's his lineage. Right. You see that you see that Ruth is mentioned in, in the Lord's lineage in the Gospels. 
So that's a very important thing. You see that exaltation. Let me read to you a, a note from uh, or a comment from William Lesore and David Hubbard and Frederick Bush in their, their book, Old Testament Survey. It says, in much of the Bible, God intervenes directly and supernaturally in human affairs to affect the purposes of redemption. But in Ruth, no guidance comes through dreams, visions, angelic messengers, or voices from heaven. No prophet arises to announce, thus says the Lord. Instead, God is everywhere, but totally hidden in purely human coincidences and schemes. God's firm, loving providence lurks behind Ruth's, quote, lucky meeting with Boaz, 2, 3, and 4, and Naomi's risky plan, 3, 1 to 5. In short, the book stresses that God works behind the scenes in the deeds of faithful persons like Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz. Now, to me, this is a significant thing. You see, it is important to perceive in your life, your everyday, ordinary life, that God is working. You see, God is at work, not only in the big and the thunderous, but in the very small. You see, he is working in those things. He works through these faithful people. And that's very much in that sense. It's very much like what you see in Esther. You see, where you have God hardly mentioned or or maybe not even mentioned expressly. But yet you see his hand everywhere. You see, there you get the message in Esther. It just so happened. It just so happened. It just so happened. And the idea is that, well, it didn't just so happen. (laughs) You see, it happened because God is controlling things. And this is what you see here. When, when you know, Ruth goes out there and she happens to wind up in Boaz's field, right after Boaz is married. You know, all right, so that's, see, it is God at work this kind of way. See, in a hidden sense, but still at work powerfully. And we need to see that in our lives. We need to see that as a church, that God is working in these things, as I say, not always in thunder. The story also points out that God welcomes into the covenant non-Israelites who are willing to give him their allegiance and loyalty. Right? Ruth is a Moabite, and I'll say more about that and what that means. But she is a Moabite by birth, but she chose to come to God and she was blessed to become the great grandmother of King David. So here's this Moabite, a nation that had a long standing enmity with Israel. And yet she becomes the great grandmother of King David and In David's lineage comes the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see this idea that that God welcomes into the covenant non-Israelites. And the story also displays the goodness of practicing this idea, practicing hesed. Practicing hesed and the blessings that accompany doing so. God not only blesses the one who practices hesed, but uses that person as a vehicle to bless other people. Now this word hesed, this Hebrew word, It's one of these things that's difficult to define. Let me give to you a quote from Daniel Block in his commentary. He says, Hesed is one of those Hebrew words whose meaning cannot be captured in one English word. This is a a strong relational term that wraps up in itself an entire cluster of concepts, all the positive attributes of God. Love, mercy, grace, kindness, goodness, benevolence, loyalty, covenant, faithfulness. In short, that quality that moves a person to act for the benefit of another without respect to the advantage it might bring to the one who expresses it. Now, that sounds an awful lot like agape. Right? Sacrificial commitment to the welfare of another. There's great overlap between this notion of hesed and when the Greek term agape. So here you have the idea of this kind of living and commitment. This godliness is a wonderful thing that is bless, brings blessing to the practitioner. And then also the practitioner is used by God as a vehicle to bless other people. So that's one of the things that we'll see in here. All right, let's, uh, let's have a look. First five verses. That's all we'll get, get through, I think, here. He says, in the days when the judges ruled... There was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. 
And she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years and both Malon and Kilian died. So that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. But here you have these two Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. And Ruth 1.1, it specifies, as I said, that the events are taking place in the days when the judges ruled, which, as I said, is that period of time sometime after, after Joshua's death, 1366, sometime after that, down to the anointing of Saul in 1051 B.C. as king. So sometime in that period, and this, you know, was a very dark period in Israel's history. It was a time when there was no king in Israel And as the writer of Judges said, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Okay, it's a very tumultuous time in the life of Israel. You see that statement in Judges 17, 6 and 21, 25. The people at that time, what do they do? They repeatedly, they abandoned the Lord. They were then oppressed by a foreign power as divine punishment. They cried out for deliverance. They then were delivered by a judge whom God raised up. And then the cycle repeats. And you see this over and over again. They are disobedient. They are then oppressed as punishment. They cry out to God. He raises up a judge. The judge delivers them. And what do they do? Right back to it. You see it right back. So this is, this is a difficult time. Robert Hubbard in his commentary on the book of Ruth, he says, The book of Judges teems with violent invasions apostate religion, unchecked lawlessness, and tribal civil war, these threaten fledgling Israel's very survival. That's the kind of circumstance in which this is taking place. It's that time where there was no king and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That time when people were periodically rebelling against God. A very difficult time in the life of Israel. That's when this story is taking place. And despite Israel's faithlessness at the time, Okay, we know what's going on during the period of Judges despite that. Despite Israel's faithlessness, we see in the book of Ruth that God was doing what? He was guiding history at that very time. He was guiding history to bless the nation through the future birth of King David. So here they are rebelling and God is delivering them. They cry out, delivering them, delivering them again and again. Well, what's he doing? He's working. And what is he going to do? There was no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. I got somebody for you. You see, I am working even now, way down the road, to bring King David. And so you see God at work there. Now, in those days, you had a famine in the land of Israel, which prompts Elimelech and Ephrathite from Bethlehem and Judah to move to Moab with his wife, Naomi, And their two sons, Malon and Kilian. Now, the author points out in in verse 6 of chapter 1 that the Lord, when the famine ends, the Lord, he says, provided food. Okay, so who's who's the one who gives the food? Well, the Lord gives the food. And the implication then is, well, why was there a famine? Well, there was a famine because the Lord was not giving food. Right? So the Lord withheld food. And then the Lord, in verse 6, the famine ends because the Lord chooses to provide food. Now, given the the disobedience that is typical or widespread in the judges' period, perhaps one is to understand that the famine that took place, that that was in fulfillment of God's promise in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 19 and 20, and Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 23 and 24, to punish the people with droughts should they persist in rebellion and pagan behavior. You know that promise. But he says, when you come into land, you're going to act this way, and he's going to punish them there. One of the ways would be with droughts if they persist in that kind of behavior. So maybe the writer is thinking that, look, you ought to understand that as the background of the famine. In Judges, this famine was, in fact, uh, God's punishment for their rebellious behavior. But the fact the author, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, you know, make any connection with that. He gives no hint of a connection between the famine and... And God's punishment. He doesn't say anything about it. So even if the writer wants us to know that in the background, the fact he doesn't tie it up and bring it up suggests that it's not significant for the point he's making. In other words, it may be that he intends for us to be aware of that, but the fact he doesn't ring that bell at all is an indication that we're not to lean too heavily on that. 
And I say that, I make that point because you'll see there are people that I think do lean too heavily on that and they draw some conclusions that I disagree with. But you may agree with them, but you know how I work this, right? I tell you how I understand this, you then take it for, uh, I just hope that how I do is in some way beneficial to you. Now, so you know, mentioning the famine, it could be just, you know, it could simply be that uh, it serve as background for how this Jewish family wound up in Moab. The famine may simply be that way, or it may be intended to remind the readers of, of the patriarchs. Okay, such as Abraham in Genesis 12:10, Isaac in Genesis 26:1, and Jacob and his sons in Genesis chapters 41 through 50, who were driven by famine to what? Sojourn in foreign lands. Okay, it could be, see, it could be a reminder to people, a link to the patriarchs who also were driven by famine to sojourn in foreign lands. And if that's how it's functioning, well, then what does it do? It then it gets the reader excited about God is working in this. And now I want to see how's it going to unfold. You see, this is a story artfully told. So he says, okay, so now you're grabbed. He says, all right, well, God is doing something. You see, here are people going because of famine. They're sojourning in foreign lands. I remember that happening. I remember that happening with Abraham. I remember that happening with other patriarchs. And God was doing great things in their lives, so maybe something's afoot. What's going to come of this? So it it generates some some excitement there and heightens interest in how the story would unfold. Now, the the severity of the famine is is perhaps implied, again, you, you know, you How much you draw from these things is always kind of up in the air. But it is perhaps implied by the fact that Bethlehem in Hebrew, it means house of bread. Okay, so maybe you're getting something of the severity of the famine. The town was presumably named house of bread because barley and wheat and other crops, they were plentiful in the area. So if the famine forces you to flee the house of bread, well, you got an idea that, you know, it's pretty rough. You see, things are pretty difficult, so then we have Elimelech and his family going. Now, some commentators, they're convinced. Now, there are a couple of things that I think are important to decide on in how you read the theology of the book. Okay, there are, there are a number of commentators, you know, good evangelical, very qualified people who, who they're convinced that Elimelech's leaving of Israel for Moab was an act of faithlessness on his part. See, for which he and his family were punished. In other words, it it was sinful for him to leave Israel and go to Moab. And so that's a key then, see, for the story, because here we now have God disciplining them and punishing them for this sinful activity. Okay, now, how do they get how do they get to that point? Well, they reason, you see, that the that the, the famine was in fact punishment for Israel's sins. And I said, you know, that it may be that the writer wants you to take that as background. Because God had said in the Old Testament, listen, if, you're, if you persist in your, rebellious, your rebelliousness, I'm going to bring drought, among other things. So they say, listen, well, this then is punishment for Israel's sin. And then we also see that God had promised that he would lift his punitive curse in that case where he punishes the people with things like drought, that he would lift his punitive curse if the people would repent. You see that in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 3 and verses 8 through 10. So then they say, listen, this is punishment for Israel's sin. God had promised that if the people of Israel would repent, he would remove his punitive curse. So therefore, it was incumbent upon a faithful Israelite when the nation was being punished for sin to remain there To help bring about the nation's repentance. For you to flee in that circumstance would be an act of faithlessness. All right, so that's one of the ways that they get there. And then the fact that Limelech, he went to Moab, which was a long-standing enemy of Israel. They take that as a corroborating indication, you see, of an impure heart. Not only do we have this argument that you see faithful, you would have stayed and worked for the repentance of the nation. But you didn't only flee, you fled to Moab. And Moab, you see, these are long-standing enemies. And then finally, they have Naomi's declarations. That her suffering was God's punishment. You see in chapter 1, verse 13, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. And they say, look, she's saying that her punishment was, was brought about. She was being punished by God. And it is assumed that that punishment related 
to the family's move to Moab and that Naomi's assessment of what was going on is correct. So those are the basically the reasons that lead people to think, listen, when he went to Moab, he was sinning. He was doing wrong. All right, well, that's important to, to decide on. Because that shapes then, all right, well, how do you read God's work after that? All right, that's one of the things. Now, Moab, by the way, you may know this, but here is Moab. It refers to this region you see here east of the Dead Sea. There you see up front, you see Jerusalem there, and then right below it is Bethlehem. And there's Moab. Now, some think, well, look, it's too close to be free of of a famine. If there was a famine in in Israel, then there's going to be a famine in Moab. Well, historically, that's not true because there have been circumstances where the situation has been different. But beyond that, could not God, God could create a famine in, you know, a hundred square feet if he wanted. He can make it rain here. If God's the one withholding the food, he just withhold it here. And he could have all kinds of things growing there, right? So uh, I'm not very impressed with that idea. But I wanted you to see where Moab is. Now, the evidence that I just... I just related to you for this view that Elimelech's leaving and going to Moab, that it was sinful. It's it's weaker than it may initially appear. Okay, I I don't agree with that. I want to tell you why I think the evidence there, those reasons aren't as weighty as as they may sound. As I as I said before, the fact the author, he gives no hint that the famine was punishment for Israel and says nothing about that. Okay, the fact the author says nothing about that means to me that even if that's true, which he may expect you to understand that in the background, see, it's, it's, being, it's being punishment then, it's not significant for his point. If it was significant for his point, I would expect him to tip toward it at least, to say something about it, to raise a flag a little bit so I could see that, all right, this is something that's key to what you're saying. But you just have nothing but silence. So it doesn't seem valid to me for somebody to make that a key to the story by saying, all right, he's punishing Israel. That then becomes the key because he had said that he would remove that punitive curse if the people repented. Therefore, his leaving was an act of faithfulness because he should have stayed. That's reading an awful lot to me into silence and perhaps maybe an assumption that the author understands you to have. Okay, so the first place there, I'm not sold on that. Now, Moab and Israel, you say, well, how about his fleeing to Moab? Isn't that a corroborating indication of some kind of faithless or impure heart? And Moab and Israel, they did have a long history of enmity and hostility toward one another. But that need not mean that choosing to reside there temporarily during a famine was an affront to God. Okay, it doesn't have to mean that. They, yes, they did have enmity and they were, ho- they were hostile toward one another. But how about 1 Samuel 22, verses 3 and 4? Reports that David, now he's a man of undeniable faith, he entrusted his parents to the king of Moab when he was fleeing from King Saul. And David, right? David, where did he live when he was fleeing? He lived among the Philistines. In 1 Samuel chapter 27, and though he was fleeing a king who was trying to kill him, some people try to distinguish it that way and say, well, yeah, but he was getting away from a king who was trying to kill him. Well, I think a famine's pretty threatening. And a famine's dangerous. So I don't think you can simply say, look, they were, Moab and Israel were hostile, so if you went there, it then means that, uh, you know, you have some kind of black heart or something. It may have been he's just escaping the famine, and that was the closest place where there was grub. Okay, so I think I think that that doesn't do it for me. Now, the fact Naomi attributed her suffering to God, it need not mean that she was being punished for her for moving to Moab or for allowing her sons to marry Moabite women, for that matter. I'm going to talk a lot about that, perhaps more than you'd care me to for me to in a minute. But see, that it need not mean that. See, she had certainly suffered and there's no question she had suffered in a way that I don't think we could appreciate How difficult her circumstance was, how bleak her situation appeared, how she was just getting pounded. And I think we have to grasp that, I think, to see really the the power of the story. So she was definitely getting, she suffered, but as in the case of Job. You see, as in the case of Job, God may have allowed it for some non-punitive purpose to which we're not privy. Or God may have been orchestrating David's ancestry, something we are privy to in the story. See, so, I mean, the idea that the the importance for how you read the book is, are you going to look at it like the prodigal son? Or are you going to look at it like Job? 
You see, there's a difference there. And what I'm suggesting to you is I, I'm more like a Job person. I don't think in her situation, I don't think that, that they're being punished for these things. I don't think that's what's going on. Now, I have some other things. See, the, so those are the, the reasons that are typically given for believing that Elimelech's flight to Moab was sinful or an act of faithlessness. I've given you those reasons and I've, I've just tried to explain to you why I think those reasons are not as weighty as they may appear at first. But in addition to that, there are some things that weigh against Elimelech, Elimelech's sojourning in Moab being an act of faithfulness. And one of those things is the fact that the author gives no hint of condemnation regarding their move to Moab or their living there. Okay, this is different than the idea of saying he not only gives no hint, doesn't say anything about, listen, the famine was God's punishment. He doesn't say anything about that. But neither does he give any clue that, listen, the move to Moab was something despicable, sinful, shameful, something that shouldn't have been. He doesn't say anything about it. Okay, so again, it seems to me you're reading an awful lot into the silence. Let me read to you what the Fred, Frederick Bush says. This is in his commentary on, the, on Ruth. It's in the Word Biblical Commentary series. He says, while noting the implications of this highlighted detail, and the highlighted detail he's talking about is the origin of Elimelech's family. See, that's one thing that is emphasized, right? Man of Bethlehem and Judah, from the, uh, you know, the Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. You get that thing hit twice in the first two verses. You don't have anything said about as the famine punishment. You don't have anything said about condemnation for the move. Well, he says, while noting the implications of this highlighted detail of the origin of Elimelech's family, it's also important to stress the lack of implications in the broad general statements with which our author sketches the rest. There's not the faintest suggestion, for example, that there's any opprobrium to be attached to the move to Moab or that the famine is Israel's punishment for her sin. Especially there's not the slightest hint that the tragic deaths of Elimelech and his sons in any way resulted from their having forsaken their people in a time of trouble, or their having moved to Moab where the sons married Moabite women. Later rabbinic exegesis used such themes of retribution and punishment to the full, and he cites another commentary by a guy named Campbell, but they are read into the story, not out of it. None of this is relevant to the story's meaning simply because the author leaves all such questions totally in the background by design, in my opinion. To raise such questions, indeed, to give any more details would have been a distraction from the complete journey to and from Moab and its cause are but the background and setting for the main problem the story addresses, which is depicted in the second section, verses 3 through 5. And what's in 3 through 5? You wind up saying, but Elimelech, the husband of Elimelech, died. She's got two sons. They die. And she's left with what? No children. No husband. No grandchildren. And she is a woman in the ancient world. You see, and like I say, that it's hard for us to understand that. It was, a, it was a different place where a woman cut off from significant male connections was in big trouble. She couldn't run down to some local agency and say, I need food. I need this. I need that. She was just cast out. You know, had to gut it out. Had to live in a horribly difficult circumstance. And you have to feel the weight of that. Because when you when we read this and you see Naomi's just suffering. When you see her crying out about how God has afflicted her and has turned against her. Well, then you understand. She is getting the hammer. Have you ever had in your life experiences that were just sitting here, you don't understand them, you can't figure it out, and you feel like I'm getting pounded? What is, what's this with God? Why has He turned on me? I can't get, look, this is hard. God can't, he, he's just against me. He's become my enemy. He pursues me. That's like right out of Psalms, right? You see, what's happened? And so that's what's happened to her. And you have to feel that. If you want to really, I think, appreciate the story, you have to see her loss, see her suffering, see what is happening to her. And just like where you're like lost going, what in the world? 
Why is this going on? Why is this going on? And then we see in the book what is happening. God is doing something. He's working. Right? He's working. Now, when you're in the midst of the storm, it's hard to see. It's hard to understand what in the world's happening. But as we come out through the writing of this book, we say, ah, I see what's happened. I see. I see what's happened. I see how God was working. I see how he was this sow's ear into a silk purse. So it's a very important thing, I think, to, to grasp and, and to see. And we'll talk about, talk about that some more. Um, now, also weighing against this notion that Elimelech's sojourning in Moab was an act of faithlessness is the fact that God graciously spares Elimelech's line from extinction and he reverses Naomi's emptiness without any indication of a change in Naomi's heart. That's significant to me. If you're saying, well, here is this rebellious person over here, kind of analogous to the prodigal. Well, then where's the repentance? Now, you have some people say, well, she went back to Bethlehem. But listen, she only went back to Bethlehem after the famine was over. That was her whole reason for leaving. It's not like she ever changed. She said, listen, I'm with Elimelech. We're leaving. Why? Because there's a famine and there's no food. Now there's food. Okay, I'll go back. I wouldn't have left if there had been food. So you can't read into that, in my judgment, that there's any indication. Oh, yeah. okay, it was wrong for me to leave. Now I'm going back, even though the famine's still going. Now she goes back when the famine's over. So I don't think there's any indication you see of a change in in, in Naomi's heart. Okay, so that says to me that that this isn't some kind of sinful act of which he has to repent. Now, the names of the family members, and I think the the bell will ring here in a second. The names of the family members, you have uh, Elimelech, Naomi, Malon, and Kilian. They occur only here in the Old Testament, and I'll pick up there next week. Thanks for coming, Lord willing. 